All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Anton, and I'll be moderating the webinar. In today's webinar, we'll be covering the four pillars of making a great mobile app, architecture, scalability, measurability, and team dynamics. Um, with that, I wanted to introduce our speakers today, Christine and Simon. Uh, Christine? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christine. I lead uh, product growth at Embrace. We are a mobile-only tool that helps developers monitor their apps and then get down to the nitty-gritty and debug them. Hi, everyone. I'm Simon. Uh, I'm a software engineer of many years. I run a software agency. I previously worked at Facebook for a number of years um, on their front-end engineering team. Um, I more recently uh, worked at uh, Google on the YouTube team, so I've done a bunch of different stuff. And, um, and now I do consulting and software development with uh, startups. You now have a presenter. OK. So you know we're going to talk to you about the uh, four pillars uh, today of uh, of building a great mobile app. And so I'm going to talk about the first two here, so architecture and scalability. And um, I, I think that uh, first let's just kind of you know define what, what we're talking about here. So uh, I think really software architecture is about designing and building a system in a way that uh, not just meets the project requirements, but does so in a robust way, right? So the characteristics of, of good architecture can depend on your needs, right? Like, like what particular you know, things are important to you uh, or, or to your product. Um, but I think broadly speaking, good ar architecture includes correctness, right? So like if your uh, uh, software doesn't uh, you know, do what it's meant to do, if it doesn't compute the correct answer, it doesn't matter how performant it is, right? So correctness I always think of as number one. Uh, maintainability is, is important um, if, you're, if you're gonna grow. Uh, resilience, right? Like, like how is it going to stand the test of time or, or the test of load? Uh, and then scalability uh, and performance. And so, you know, if, if we kind of like drill down into scalability in particular, right? Uh, I think that, you know, typically people think of scalability as just, will my server fail if there's a bunch of users using it? Um, and that is, you know, an, an accurate representation of, of one facet of scalability. But I also think about like, will this software will this app scale with your business, right? Like as your business needs new features, can we add, can we scale up the feature set? Um, does your development team scale, right? Can you, um, you know, can you go from being a two, you know, going from being a two developer team, and I, I've done this on a project to going to being, you know, uh, nine or 10 or 12 developers is is a big jump. And then that, that next jump is going up to like, you know, 50 or things like that. So so can it, can it scale uh, that way, right? And so, you know, I, I tend to think of it as uh, future-proof, like how future-proof is your app that, that kind of dictates that. Um, and, you know, broadly looking at these, these topics, I think about it this way, or, or the question that I'd like you to kind of ask yourself is this, what makes production software different from like a hackathon project or a hobby project, right? <clears throat> and so you think about it, um, and there's numerous reasons that, that production software is, uh, sort of operates at scale, that, it, that is well architected and has scalability. And, and I can't cover all those in this talk, but uh, I've picked a few that I think are pretty important, at least in the, in the context of mobile apps or front-end development. And you know, I think about uh, modularity, I think about you know, UI, uh, you know, like thinking globally in terms of your global reach, uh, you know, debugging, theming, uh, feature gating, and we're, we're gonna kind of dive into these today. So this is kind of you know, the summary of what I'm gonna talk to you about. And so the, the first thing that I wanna talk about is build code to be thrown away. And what do I mean by that? Um, uh, essentially, you're not gonna throw away your entire code base, but over time you are, right? So one piece at a time. So, so pieces, components of your code base should be built um, with a lifespan in mind that you're gonna replace them eventually, right? So you think about this is the opposite of what, you know, your modern laptop or iPhone is, right? Where you can't just replace a certain piece of it. Um, you have to throw the whole device away. That is not what you want at software and, at, at scale, right? Production quality software. You need to be able to take a, a, a piece out and, and iterate and evolve your, your software over time. Um, and so you need to be able to move fast, right? I mean, in this industry, uh, you're not going to make it if you don't if you don't move fast, right? Uh, it's a high paced it's a high paced game we're playing, and so uh, that means creating things that you know are not perfect, right? You should be creating things that you're like, you know, what this is iteration one, this is you know MVP, this is something that this is a feature that we're going to put out there to test it, and you know that you're going to iterate on that, and that that is not the final thing. Um, so. You know, knowing, like building things in a way that you're going to be like, okay, cool, I'm going to rip that out later and, or I'm going to iterate on that and change that um, allows you to kind of move forward with, with minimal friction. So uh, how do you do that? Uh, decoupled components, right? Um, 
from a UI standpoint, from a mobile app, uh, like certain flows, you know, the auth flow is going to change at some point. The, the you know, the uh, uh, transaction history or the, you know, uh, my profile or the feed, you know, these things individually should be uh, decoupled from the rest of the system as much as possible. And, and I like to even think about decoupled logic, right, in terms of we already have that to some extent with like microservices or with, you know, the, the kind of divide between server and client so that uh, you, you can swap things out on the server side and, and, and the client um, is essentially decoupled from how the data is stored or, you know, the client doesn't need to know if you're using Postgres or, or Mongo because you have that nice decoupling layer. And, and so I, I'd encourage you to think about that, that aspect of architecture uh, when you're building your, your mobile app. And you know, on that topic, you, you think about UI is going to change over time. Um, and you know, uh, I kind of like this slide because you know, I remember using these old phones you know, with T9 and stuff, and you think about Nokia was king back then, right? Nokia had uh, an incredible market share. They had a really incredible product. Um, but now they're nothing, right? There's nothing left. Um, they, they, they couldn't keep up. They couldn't really, uh, uh, they got, um, they couldn't innovate. They couldn't move fast when when it came, you know, when when the smartphone revolution came around. And so, um, you know, th th that's a little bit of a of a side note because UI is one piece of that, as as well as you know, business aspects to it. But but ultimately, um, think about it this way: De design refreshes are going to happen. They're going to happen often. Um, if you use well thought out UI theming patterns. Um, That'll make this less painful, right? Think about when dark mode, dark mode came out last year, and, and all these companies scrambling to try to figure out how am I going to get my UI to be rethemed into dark mode. Um, you know, the companies that made good, um, you know, mobile app architecture decisions early on, good theming patterns, use the right theming libraries, uh, are, are probably coming out winning, right? And so, at minimum, uh, you know, if you don't take anything else away from the UI theming piece, is that just you know, have your developers put your colors, your font sizes, your your font families, put things like that into a theme. Uh, file and like put it in a place where you can tweak it and adjust it and change it. Um, now, you know, the other piece of that is that not only is your UI going to change over time, but your entire app is going to be evolving. And, you know, when you're writing small, you know, small stuff, when you're writing side projects and hackathons and stuff, you don't really have to think about what, what, what's going to be the state of this in two years. But when you're building production scale stuff, you need to think about what's going to happen. You know, and so like here's a perfect example like uh, of, of an app. If you haven't updated this app in you know, a year and a half or maybe even six months, you're, you're going to see a screen that's like, hey, look, this version is no longer supported. You need to, you need to update it. And so um, you know, the takeaway from this is be aware that there will be many versions out there in the wild. There is no way that you can for, you know, it's not the web. Like mobile apps is not the web where, where every time they visit your website, they're going to get the latest version of the, of the page. Um, this, is a, this is a process that, that not all users follow, which is you know, going to the App Store and doing the updates. Some people have automatic updates, some people don't. And so just be aware. These are things you have to think about at scale. Um, you don't want to be stuck supporting a legacy uh, client you know, app version forever. You want to be able to move quickly with your backend. You want to be able to, to deprecate things. And so I, th I think the correct approach there is to make a clean, well-defined UI that just tells users, uh, like, you know, so if it receives some signal from the server, if the server says minimum supported version is 2.1 and they've got 1.8, um, that, that this thing will pop up and display it. And this is something you have to think about at the beginning because if you don't put that screen in the app, if you don't think about versioning and deprecation early on, um, you can't add that later because those apps are already out there. They're already on people's phones, right? Now. You know, when we think about versions that are out there in the wild, uh, you know, another thing is, like, like, what does the landscape look like? Um, you know, like, how do we think globally? And so, uh, obviously, there's internationalization and there's, there's languages and stuff. Um, one thing that I think people don't always think about is not everybody has the device that you and me are using, right? Uh, we're probably on something relatively recent. You know, you look at even the U.S. market is something like 50, 60 percent iPhone. That is not representative of the world, right? Uh, only about four percent of people live in the U.S. Um, if you're a small town bank in Idaho, you probably don't have to think globally. You don't have to think about internationalization. You don't have to think about what devices are, are common in, in um, you know, Asia Pacific or, or Europe. Uh, but but if you're if you're competing on the world stage, I mean, if you're building software at scale, uh, you do need to think about these things. And it's not just like the, the device landscape. It's also uh, latency. Um, you know, intermittent connectivity. Uh, thinking about different time zones. Thinking about date formats. Right. Um, metric system is, is a common one that people overlook. 
uh, currencies, languages. You know, an interesting thing when I think about displaying different content for different regions, right? So like it's it's common for you to say, to talk, you know, you, you've got this cool app uh, on the home screen, you roll out something that talks about the Super Bowl coming up, right? That doesn't, maybe that doesn't mean anything to somebody in Bolivia or somebody in Thailand, right? Um, or, you know, you say, hey, what are the hot summer fashions? And it's right in your homepage, a feature thing about the new summer, you know, trends or whatever. And then, you know, you don't really think, well, it's not summer everywhere, right? It's not summer in Sydney or Melbourne or, or South Africa. So, you know, thinking just ahead about uh, uh, what is the content I want to show in my app to different regions? Do I want to be able to feature gate this? Do I want to be able to say, okay, this region sees this thing and this other region sees another thing? And, 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 and part of that is making your app, like if you want to scale, making your app sticky, making it interesting for, for different people. But, um, you know, like, like the, the, these are all not the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room when, when it comes to you know, thinking globally is internationalization, right? I18N, um, and this is uh, you know, pretty standard thing. We've been doing this for many years. The software industry understands this, but you know, if you take nothing else away from this, I want you to, to know it is way easier to think about this from the start than to try to you know, slip this in later. It is incredibly hard to, to sort of tack on internationalization uh, once you realize that, oh shoot, you know we're we're expanding into Europe, or you know maybe even we're expanding, you know, north of the border to Canada, and we need to support French, right? Um, so I would say this, like like this is what I do with my team. Um, you know, I don't want to add a ton of friction uh, to to my developers, but early on, I always say at the minimum, just wrap your user facing static strings, right? I'm not gonna, you know, obviously we can't do anything about user generated content, but the content that we write, you know, the the text, the labels, the buttons, the uh, the, the the stuff that the static strings that are written in the source code, wrap those in an internet, you know, like like in in our tech framework, we use a little T function for translate. Um, I don't have to translate them today. I just want to wrap them in a way so that it can be done in the future. And then you know dates and numbers, right? So always store and transmit your dates in you know ISO standard formats, and then um, you know wrap your dates and your numbers in the right function calls. So you just display it in the right format for that locale. Uh, you know I, I don't want to go down this path too far because I know that this could be a whole entire tech talk. But you know if you really want to dive in, you can start thinking about you know how do I know which language to send out a push notification, or you know, um, or, or what, what do I do for for languages that are left to right layouts, right? Uh, RTL layouts, uh, right to left. So you think about um, you know. Hebrew and Arabic and things. So, you know, that's the hardcore internationalization stuff. But if you take nothing else away, take the three points about strings, dates, and, and numbers. Um, featured gating. And so this is an interesting topic that I never really thought about before joining Facebook. Um, and so we had a really powerful system internally at Facebook for turning features on and off for users, right? And, and the reason why we do that, the analogy is like uh, changing the engine uh, of, of the plane while the aircraft is in flight. Right? And I think that'll make more sense as I, as I try to explain this. So the idea is this. So imagine you want to build a feature that's you know, a, a UI refreshing your app, and it's going to take many iterations. Um, you, you could say, all right, well, you know, I can't just stop development on my main normal UI uh, and go off into a refresh. I can't just like you know land the plane, take the app down, do my work, and then put the app back up again. Um, can't do that either. Uh, now, I, what I could do is kind of fork it and have this team over here that's kind of working on the new look and feel and this new awesome feature, and then everybody else is kind of going down the normal path of, of keeping it running. But then I have this like feature where I have to merge the two back in together, and that, that's going to be a problem as well. Um, and then also the fact that like you know do I then test it all in the sandbox environment and then merge it later? But then I haven't really tested it in prod and. And so uh, the, the correct answer to this, like what, what the big tech companies, what the pros do with this, is that we, we, we build in a system to uh, uh, flag or gate features on or off for different users. So you basically are building on the main production build the whole time, but your users aren't seeing it. You, it's, it's behind a gate and you just turn it off. Um, now the advantage of this is that uh, not only do you have, not have to worry about like the complexity of merging this you know, fork or this branch in, but you also get the, uh, get the ability to, to have certain users test it, right? So you're like, hey, I'm gonna roll this out to 5%. I'm gonna roll this out to you know, this region only. You know, at Facebook, we often roll things out to New Zealand only because they were kind of English speaking, but far away in a small population, and we can kind of you know, guinea pig with that a little bit. Um, but like, uh, uh, it was very common to roll things out 1%, 5%, 10%, you know, and then you have a holdout, so you roll it out 95%, you can kind of see, okay, these people are using the new feature, these people aren't, so can we see you know, engagement going up or down, um, things like that. So uh, feature gating is, you know, again, a big topic. I, I can't cover it completely in here, but, but I think it's something to think about when you're thinking about uh, software at scale. Uh, and then you've got you know, error handling. 
debugging, right? It's really easy to debug when you're in the simulator, when you're locally, when you're in development. Uh, what happens when things go wrong in production, right? And so uh, there's a few things you can do, you know, that you can think about in terms of architecting your app so that debugging in the wild is going to be less painful. So uh, obviously, you know, table stakes here, error logging and reporting, you know, I, I assume you're already doing that. Uh, one of the things is make sure that you are collecting the right uh, information, right? So when you make an error log, like let's make sure we have the app version. That's that's probably a no-brainer. What about the locale? What about basic device info? What about I need to know if they're on an iPhone 5C? I need to know what operating system version they're on. Uh, and then the other thing is like make sure you're not just collecting crash reports. Crash reports are great, but I need to know when things unexpected when the when the user gets into kind of a weird state when when they're somehow in this you know stuck situation and those server requests aren't aren't working. Like log as much as you can uh, to to help you kind of debug those things. And then also, you know, think about your kind of signal to noise ratio uh, in terms of the notifications that your developers or your your uh, sort of uh, a DevOps team or, or whoever's responding to these things. Make sure that they're not getting bombarded because I remember, you know, it's very easy. To, you're getting so much information coming in that you can't even filter out what's relevant. Like, like what is an actual spike in 404 errors being returned from the server or 500 errors that the client doesn't know how to handle? Like, like is that an actual spike or is it loss of the noise, right? Um, and then you know m maybe one interesting thing that you that you don't always think about is that users will do stuff you really don't expect. And, and so my, my sort of favorite example of that is uh, so when I was at YouTube, we had uh, bug reports that were coming in uh, or er error reporting that was coming in that was uh, absolutely not reproducible. It was only happening on Android. It was a very small percentage, but extremely uh, steady. Um, percentage of, of devices that were getting these errors that we, we couldn't even track down to like a, a place in code. Like it didn't even match up with like a spot in code where things are going wrong. Line numbers weren't even there. Like we didn't have enough information. We couldn't figure it out. Turns out, so on Android, uh, you can uh, sideload uh, apps. You, you can install apps that don't come from the Play Store. And so what happens is that there are people who take you know the YouTube app and the Spotify app and other apps, and they and, and they kind of decompile it and they mess with the code and they add things to remove the ads to, to add premium features that you would normally have to pay for, and they kind of manipulate and, and, and inject things in, and then they distribute these APKs around in the kind of dark corners of the internet and and users uh, install these things. But what what they don't do obviously because you know the, these. These guys are, are hacking together some some really you know dirty stuff, and and they're not it's, they're not writing clean code that's for sure, and, and so they're not they're not taking out the error reporting. The error reporting is still there, and we're getting errors that don't even make any sense because it's code that we didn't write. It's code that's been manipulated, and 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 you know it, it took an enormous amount of effort and time to kind of diagnose what was happening there, like why are we getting these bug reports, and then eventually to filter it out. And so these are you know stories that you kind of learn working at scale that you're like wow I um you know you don't you don't think about that somebody's going to modify my app out there. Um, so anyway, if you you know take this away from it, that uh, debugging is really hard, and in the wild it's even harder. And so, uh, you know, expect the unexpected if that makes any sense. Users will do things, uh, things will go wrong. You know, and then maybe lastly, like at a place where users can just submit some feedback, it's way easier to just ask the user, get in contact with them, figure out what they were trying to do, than just try to you know filter through automated log files. Uh, automated testing, I probably don't have to, you know, I, I assume everybody who's been building software understands that software engineers need to write tests, and so I won't harp on a lot about that, but I will say this. Um, you have, you know, especially on the business side, you have limited resources and you want to maximize those resources uh, in, in terms of developer, uh, you know, time and energy and effort. And so, uh, you know, how do we invest our testing effort where we get the most return? And so if you've seen this, this kind of classic testing pyramid, you know, you've got your unit tests, which is your baseline, you do the most of those, do a few uh, fewer integration tests, and you do the fewest or the, the, uh, a little bit of investment in end-to-end -end testing. What I mean by that uh, specifically is that um, uh, unit tests are basically easy, you know, that's your baseline, it's your bottom of the pyramid. They're easy for developers to write, they're fairly robust, they're not going to break easily, they're, they're tightly coupled to the code though, um, but they're, um, you know, e easy wins. So you, so you invest, you do the most of those, right? Uh, write a healthy amount of integration tests, particularly focus on regressions, right? So when things go wrong that you didn't previously expect, you fixed it, let's make sure it doesn't break again, let's make sure it stays fixed. So you write an integration test for that, right? Integration tests are, you know, things that incorporate multiple aspects of your uh, code. And then you get your end-to-end -end test, which is like when you fire up the app in an actual simulator in a server farm somewhere, um, and then and then it like simulates clicks through the entire flow. It usually does this against a production database with maybe a test login or against a, a, a simulated database. These things are really hard to get right. They're very 
flaky and finicky because like as you change the user flow, you have to rewrite these things. Um, and then you know when you layer on visual snapshot tests, which is like, okay, go through this particular flow, snapshot the screen, see how many pixels have changed since the last time, and if, and if things are really wonky, then notify somebody. These are powerful tools, but they're incredibly uh, resource intensive. So uh, you know, definitely focus your effort where you get the most value out of there. Automation in terms of deployment, um, especially deployment, right? Automate as much as possible. Don't have a single point of failure, right? You never want to make the mistake of having one individual who knows how to, uh, you know, launch this app to the app store and knows how to build this or compile this this tool or the software. Um, you know, kind of interesting story there is that when I was uh, <clears throat> when I was consulting for this this telecom in Southeast Asia, and and we were gonna you know go through this kind of refresh of their mobile app, this kind of reimagination or rewrite of it, and you know we're like, okay, what's your existing app? How is it built? How do you get it onto the Play Store? And they're like, okay, cool. What we have is we have this laptop. It's in this room. Nobody touches it. It's the only laptop that knows how to build this. The guy who set it up no longer works here. You go in there with your little USB stick. You load the source code. You press a button, and then just like it does this work, and then like out pops this this APK or this IPA or whatever, and you and you send it up to the App Store. We we're like, oh my goodness. You know, you can't do this. Like, you can't have your business like depend on this laptop. Like, what happens if the hard drive crashes or gets a you know virus? And, you know, we have backups. And I was like, no, I get that. But like, like reproducible automated things. Like, you know, we have the cloud for this. Like, this should be a script that is written that happens in a in a build pipeline and things. And so that's probably an extreme example. Although probably more companies than you realize have the magic laptop in the corner in the back room. Um, you know, or maybe it's a magic server or whatever. So, uh, you know, these are things that are uh, uh, fragile and, and automation can solve this. Like if you have a policy of automation at your company from day one where it's like, you know, like every amount of knowledge to do a given task must be automated in a way uh, th that, is, that is reproducible in the cloud, um, then, you, then you will never run into this. So, uh, you know, reduce the cognitive load on your developers, right? And so, so that's in terms of uh, automate as much of, you know, code stylistic things, linting, formatting. Like, don't make your developers think about where to insert semicolons, or you know, if, if the code formatting is at the right style. Like, automate as much of that as possible so you can you move quickly. Uh, okay, so I'm almost done. Um, hopefully, I haven't used up all my time. Uh, just some some secret sauce, some things that that, that kind of I do that kind of tr you know try to give my development team some superpowers. Um, you know, generally falls under the category of work smarter, not harder, right? And which I'm sure you already know, but, but how to do that, right? So the key to, to, to lean high velocity development really is trying to do more with fewer developers. How do I do that? Um, th there's, there's probably lots of ways to do this. Uh, you know, one of the things is let's not build for iOS and then separately build for Android and then separately build for web if we can share some of that burden, share some of that code. Uh, and you know, it's been something that's sort of give or take been possible for a long time with you know, HTML5 and this and that. But like um, in modern days, Doing that in a way without killing quality and performance, right? We have these tools. We have React Native. Uh, Expo is a set of tooling on React Native. We have Flutter. Um, these are really powerful, really modern, amazing things that, that allow me, you know, so, so React Native is my poison of choice. And um, I'm able to, with a single team, with a single code base, build out a high quality, high performant app for iOS. Uh, do it for Android, and more recently, even for web with a single code base. And um, you know, uh, uh, this stuff keeps getting better, right? Uh, native Windows and Mac. Uh, native Windows is, is already out. It's been backed by Microsoft. Um, native Mac desktop apps uh, uh, built with React Native with the same code base that you're building other um, you know, web and, and mobile with. Uh, you know, it's sort of been possible with Electron, but like, like in a React Native, like a, a properly native way, this is really, really exciting stuff. So. Uh, that, that's a little bit of, of kind of how I achieve um, high velocity development at scale with uh, uh, as few developers as possible. Uh, and, and that's what I have for you. So, so thanks. I'm going to um, kind of hand this over uh, to Christine. Thanks, Simon. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about the last two pillars, measurability and uh, teams. I've worked with a lot of teams uh, during my time at Embrace, small and large, um, one of the big things that I emphasize is measuring what you're doing. Um, so measurement is important for an app because if you have no idea where you stand, you have no idea whether there is room for improvement or things are getting worse. Um, and with mobile, it's especially important because there are so many different variables. It's different from web in that every single device is its own environment. And so to predict every single thing that could go wrong is very difficult. And so if you can measure things at an extremely high level, 
and take a look at trends. It can identify things that are going wrong in your app much more easily rather than trying to mentally think about every single possible thing that can go wrong. And so when it comes to measurement, I like, I think of it in three different ways. You wanna measure stability. Is your app working the way that it's supposed to? Um, it means your app isn't crashing. You don't have frozen screens. You're not using too much CPU. There aren't memory leaks and uh, it's not causing extreme battery drainage. The second is performance. How fast is your app? Um, I think stability at this point in time is kind of table stakes. Um, a lot of times you have apps that are competing with one another and to the consumer, sometimes the feature set is pretty much the same. And what will beat out the other app is which one is faster, which one has the faster startup, which one can I start shopping with more, which one can I request food delivery faster from. Um, and so performance is very important. And then the last one is just the impact, whether it's engagement or revenue. And what's important about that is once you figure out the impact, you can it helps you prioritize what you want to focus on with your app and whether or not it's important to you and your user base. Um, maybe you are experiencing a lot of crashes on an extremely old phone or an extremely old operating system. And then you have to take a look at it and see, you know, how big is this in terms of my user base? Is this in a growing market that I am potentially trying to uh, penetrate. And so these are things that when you're measuring are very important to understand. So I'll delve into each of those three points. So um, stability, most people start off with the crash-free rate, crash-free users. Um, it's a great metric, um, but uh, stability in mobile is, goes beyond crashes because your mobile app is not only interacting with other SDKs that you've put in your app, but it's also operating within an operating system. And with Apple, for example, there are rules that are in place for best practices. And the operating system may kill your app if you are not following these best practices. So for example, if you are using too much memory and the operating system doesn't like it, it can kill your app. Will it produce a crash report? Probably not. And in those cases, um, it's not just an exception. It's not just bad code. It's you know a slow memory leak that is not producing an optimal app. And so in those cases, I like to tell people, um, stability goes beyond crashes especially with mobile because there are so many interactions and you're operating within an operating system and so if you have tooling that doesn't measure what percentage of sessions end in oom or what percentage of sessions end in user termination when the user force quits the app or what percentage of sessions end in um in a &R exit where the app is not responsive then you can take a look at some higher level metrics to help guide you um, and tell you where your app is going. So one of the big uh, metrics that I like to look into is the percentage of sessions with the cold start. So um, typically if your app goes into the background and the user opens it up again, you'll get a warm start. But if your app is using too much memory or CPU, or is hanging the main thread, the operating system will kill it if it goes into the background. So if you have a high rate of cold starts, um, it may be indicative of the operating system killing your app in the background. You will also get a cold start when a user terminates the app. And there are some people that will force quit an app just out of habit, but you do wanna look into whether or not that percentage increases. So if I see a frozen screen on um, my app, typically what I'll do is force quit. And so that will also trigger a cold startup. So if you're tracking the percentage of sessions with a cold start release over release, 
you can start to tell whether or not there's something going wrong with your app. Two other things to track in terms of stability, um, memory leaks. So the operating system will tell you um, if you have a low memory warning. And so if you keep track of that version over version and you start to see an increase in low memory warnings, it may be indicative of memory leaks with your app. Um, and then the last one is battery drainage. Uh, that produces a very poor experience for the user. And so how I like to evaluate that is taking a look at the percentage of sessions um, where the user is in low power mode and making sure that that measurement stays the same release over release. If it happens to increase in one particular release, maybe you've introduced a feature that is draining battery. The next thing is performance. Like I mentioned before, um, stability tends to be table stakes. Um, really, when you are comparing apps, you want to make sure that your app is extremely performant. I like to monitor key parts of the app. Um, for all apps, one of those uh, is startup. For an e-commerce app, it's add to cart, checkout, purchase. For maybe a social media app, that might be uploading photos. And so I like to tell um, our users to track those successes and failures in the key parts of the app and have those be KPIs. So you want to track these levels um, over time. And if there are any, any unexpected deviations, you want to make sure you can explain them. Um, for example, if you see a sudden spike in logins, it might be that your app is logging people out. And so these are things that you can keep track of in, in terms of understanding, is my app working normally? And these are very important parts of my app that I wanna make sure that we maintain just the highest performance um, within these parts. Then when you wanna get into timing, you wanna make sure that uh, everything is happening quickly. Performance is starting to become more and more of a, a differentiator. Um, so I will often ask people, you know, how long does your startup take? Do you know how long your startup takes? And do you know how long your competitor's startup takes? Um, it's a really important question. And I think a lot of people um, will assume that, you know, when they're testing their devices in a place with great Wi-Fi, on the newest iPhone, that that is exemplary, um, that exemplifies what their users are experiencing. But if you are working in international markets, that might not be the case. Your startup may work really well on the newest iPhone, but your startup may work terribly on a Redmi device or um, something, uh, it may be very slow in India, and that's a market you're entering into. And so what you want to do is you want to take into account, okay, here is maybe my ideal situation, but where are my customers at? And how long does it take for them to go through this experience? Um, I think that there are a lot of places where, I mean, you can improve on startup. And by measuring it first, you're able to establish a baseline and then take a look and see where there are possible improvements. I've worked with customers where um, it made sense for them to have blocking network calls at one point in time, maybe related to a third party SDK or their own APIs. But later on, as they have gotten more of a market share and it becomes more competitive, um, it becomes more important that you are reevaluating that and making sure that you are making it as fast as possible. The other thing that I tell mobile developers, it's taking a look at your first party API calls. Um, it's a part of the mobile experience to the user, but not entirely um, the burden of the mobile team to fix sometimes. Um, I worked with one uh, dating app where 
they kind of knew one of their endpoints was slow. Um, and they've always had an inkling. Uh, but when we actually started to take a look at it and we showed them how slow it actually was, that it was taking five to six seconds, they told me they're like, wow, we never realized it was actually that slow. And so it's important to take a look at your first party API calls, make sure that they are they are fast and that they aren't degrading over time. Um, and then the last thing to tie this all together is the impact. You want to understand how all of these things impact your app. Um, it's it'll help you prioritize issues and it'll help you see if you make improvements to the performance or you make improvements to the stability, what does that mean? And so impact is different for different types of apps. For certain apps like social media apps, it's taking a look at engagement, looking at median session duration, or the total time a user spends in the app per day. Um, with e-commerce apps, uh, it's a little bit simpler. You can measure just revenue. Um, and if you want to take a look at specific things that may go wrong in your funnel, you may want to understand what is your cart value at checkout. And if it never goes from checkout to purchase, how much are you losing? So these are kind of these high level metrics that you can monitor on your app, release of a release, to monitor the health. As you grow, um, you essentially end up slicing and dicing these metrics by region. For example, you have where you primarily operate or if you want to go into a new region, you'll slice and dice by that um, so that you can see if I am entering into India, I want the performance in India to match that of the US. Um, you may also cut it by personas. You may the, okay, I have these extremely high value users. I want to understand what their experience is like versus regular users. Or you may want to measure new user experience. What does that startup look like? Do they have to download a bunch of files? Maybe that is contributing to fewer people, uh, more people dropping off at the very beginning. So you can take these base level metrics to give you an indication of the health of your app without going too much into detail as to what is exactly breaking it. I think it gives you a good directional indicator because I think with mobile, one of the most difficult things is understanding like all of the different environments. And so if you take these measurements at extremely high level, you can kind of narrow it down from there and see where you should look. So monitoring stability and KPIs uh, is becoming increasingly important. Um, going into teams, uh, I've watched mobile teams grow a lot in the past two years. Um, I've worked with a lot of companies where they are mobile first, mobile only. And when we first met with them, they only had one or two developers. Um, they were able to run very lean. But um, I think over the past two years, mobile teams have been growing because they have been a bigger part of the revenue. I've started to see some e-commerce companies go beyond 50% revenue from their mobile app. The engagement is more on their mobile app and people are pushing their users towards the mobile app. And so I've watched teams grow from one to two developers to you know 15 plus. Um, and it's definitely a struggle. Um, and it's definitely something that I've watched them do and seen how they've morphed into it and how they've made the best of it. Um, so originally, a lot of these teams are tiny and focused on feature development. 
they are only dealing with bugs when they are a really big deal. And other than that, they are fully focused on feature development. Once, you, once the team starts growing and you have a lead, um, you, have, you start to have more people contributing to the code. You won't know everything that is happening, all of the changes that are being made. And so in these cases, as the team grows and they start to have maybe two or three developers um, report to a team lead, the structure changes in that the team lead starts focusing on the release. They will monitor those metrics that I talked about at the release level because they want to be able to tie an issue to a release and fix an issue as close to release as possible because teams will cycle through developers and if it's lost, if it's not addressed right away, sometimes it gets lost and it just gets more into the mix of the code and it gets more and more difficult to find. Um, and then as I've seen teams grow from that into very large teams where you have several feature teams, it's kind of a hub and spoke type structure. You have several feature teams with one mobile platform team that oversees all of it monitoring and monitoring stability and KPIs um, have become extremely integral because you have so many people contributing to the code and all of these things and these interactions, you cannot possibly communicate all of them. And so as these teams grow, it becomes more and more important to monitor and measure these things so that there is some indication that you you can, or there are some guardrails that will indicate if something goes wrong. And with these teams, the faster a team is able to identify an issue and then point to the person to fix it, the more successful that mobile team is. It doesn't end up getting plagued by the same issues over and over and over again. Um, definitely as teams have grown from two developers to 12 to 15, to 50, um, the biggest thing is truly monitoring. And as they are um, increasing their revenue for particular companies, where I've seen a lot of stress come from mobile teams is that they cannot tie these things to revenue or they can't tie these things to impact. And it makes things very difficult because um, Mobile developers tend to uh, code to perfection because once you make a release, it's out there. Someone may be on that one release that is two or three years old um, because they never update. And like Simon mentioned, it's not like web. It's not like web where you fix something and that new, the greatest and latest thing is pushed to everyone. And so with mobile teams, you do have this, this thing where you are trying to code to perfection. Um, but when the team grows and you have so many features that you need to build, it's difficult to, to identify something and say, okay, this is the thing that's broken, but does it affect a population or a user base that I care about? And where does this fall in the priority list? Um, and I've seen, uh, teams as they grow struggle with that. But the teams that are monitoring and have an idea of what their user base looks like and they slice and dice these issues and um, by user impact, understanding the operating system that the user is on, understanding the region that it affects or understanding the personas. Is this affecting new users? Is it affecting your uh, power users? These are all things that make it easier for the team to function well. They're able to focus on features and then own, and address the issues that actually matter and that affect the bottom line. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's, that's what I have for measurement and teams. Anton? 
Yes, thank you, Christine. Let me go ahead and take this screen from you. All right, um, so we have quite a few questions coming in, I think about 10, um, but before we get into questions, I wanted to kind of quickly share how you can stay connected with us. Um, so here's on the screen. I'll also share this PowerPoint presentation um, later today as well. And then, you know, while I'll have you here, I want to quickly share with you, um, you know, our platform. Go ahead and feel free to try it. Um, you can go ahead and go to hug.army slash free, and that'll take you to um, our registration page. Um, thank you so much for today. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.